So it's the last Sunday of the Christian year, which is always the Sunday after Thanksgiving. So I'm knowing that I wanted to, to be up here on this particular Sunday, and I'm praying about it, thinking about it, praying about what I should actually bring as a message this morning. And in the midst of everything that we have been through, going through this year locally, nationally, globally, and then going through Thanksgiving the last couple of days and, and then being thankful for all that, that, that we have and the blessings that we enjoy, it just kept coming to me that maybe I should end this ordinary time before we go into Advent with something on the subject of worry. Not to be Debbie Downer, rather to be Henry Hopeful. Because worry, for us to be the, the, the very nation that we were giving thanks for over, over the last couple of days, to be one of the most blessed and actually affluent societies and countries in the world to be such, we are also probably one of the most worry-filled societies and countries in the world, at least so it seems. According to a recent issue of the American Journal on Psychiatry, this year there will be north of 130 million prescriptions for the various tranquilizing drugs consumed in this country. The ones ranging from Xanax to Zoloft to Ambien to Valium to Ativan to the antidepressant Prozac. One in five Americans last year was on one of those or similar drugs, up 22% from 10 years ago. The fastest growing demographic in new prescriptions issued for antipsychotic or anti for tranquilizing drugs is the age group 18 to 24. Stress formula vitamins and supplements are now some of the most popular vitamin packages, even though scientists tell us that they really don't do much good, at least not the way most people take them. Panic attacks are a modern and growing phenomenon, and suicide is again on the increase of 25% overall over the past 18 years. And it's gotten to the point where if people don't worry, we worry that there's something wrong with them. You may remember the old bumper sticker that said, if you can keep your head while all about you are losing theirs, you just don't understand the situation. And for some folks, worry is their favorite pastime. And you know who I'm talking about. Now, what's more, today we know how dangerous worry can be. On the physical side, we know that worry can cause high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, ulcers, and a host of other problems. Emotionally, it makes us irritable and unstable, and spiritually, it separates us from God and from His resources for an abundant life. And in the scripture that Nancy just read for us, Jesus categorically prohibited worry in this familiar portion of the Sermon on the Mount. These are some of Jesus' most important, but some of his most misunderstood words. So what did Jesus mean by these words? Well, let me tell you first what he did not mean. Jesus did not mean that Christians should not be concerned. There is healthy concern for people in situations that we as Christians certainly should fear. He did not mean that Christians should not plan. Planning and worry are two very different things. In fact, godly planning can certainly help, off, help offset worry. If it's done in the proper perspective, Jesus did not mean that if we just trust God enough, we won't have any problems. The truth is, he promised his followers trouble and suffering in this world. And Jesus did not mean that Christians are not supposed to be industrious and hard workers. The Bible says, it's one of the big seven, 
that laziness is a sin. Now what Jesus did mean is that worry will destroy you. Spiritually and emotionally, and now we know that physically, worry will steal your joy. It will rob your strength, and it can put a barrier between you and the abundant resources that God wants to give you. So I'm going to do two things this morning in, in this series of verses. If you have your, had your Bible open, you may want to keep it open because I'm going to refer back to those verses, but I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to give you Jesus' description of worry, and then I'm going to give you his prescription for overcoming it. So Jesus' description of worry. This is going to be one of those sermons where it's going to be real easy for you to take notes if that's something that you like to do. There's room in the, the bulletin to, to do that. Jesus' description of worry, what does he tell us? Three things. Number one, worry is faith. Lessness. Now, admittedly, some of you might bristle at that. But bear with me. Worry is faithlessness. Consider the birds. They do not sow, they do not reap, they do not store in barns. In other words, they do not work. Yet God provides for them. Consider the lilies of the field. They don't labor or spin, yet God clothes them in beauty. Then look at verse 30. Will he not much more clothe you? And here's the phrase that I want you to catch. What does he say next? Will he not much more clothe you? That's not a rhetorical question. Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith, worry is faithlessness, and worriers are people of little faith. Now, over in Pittsburgh this morning, some eyebrows went up when I said that. But hang on. Because when we think of worry, don't we think of, well, I get anxious because of external circumstances? I mean, I worry because of what all is out there, and that's just not true. If that were true, we would all react the same way to the same situation, but we don't. Take two business people, put them in the same economy, the same bad economy. One will be full of anxiety and depression, and the other will walk with joy and confidence. Take two people with the same medical condition. One will wring their hands and worry about the future, while the other will walk in assurance and peace. If we worried because of the external, then all of us would react the same way to the same situation, but we don't. Why? Because worry is not caused by what's outside of us. It's caused by what's inside of us. When do we worry? When do we abject, needlessly, chronically worry? We worry when we let external circumstances move our internal thermostat from faith to fear. Now, some of you may have heard this story. You may have even heard it from, from this space up here. It's the story of the twin boys born at the same time. It's so very, very different. One of the youngsters was always negative, complaining, and unhappy. And the other one was always bright and cheerful no matter what came his way. So the mother allowed a psychologist to observe and test them. So the psychologist took the unhappy child and placed him in a room with all these bright new playthings, and the boy proceeded to demolish the room and demolish the toys, and then sat down in the middle of the room and began to cry that he was having no fun. The other youngster was taken to an old run-down barn. A barn that looked, smelled, filled with what old barns are filled with. <laughs> and after a short while, he found a shovel and he began digging around here and there and whistling and just heaping up piles of manure. And the psychologist came to check on him and said, young man, why are you so happy? And the boy didn't slow down. He just said, mister, with all this manure around, if I keep digging long enough, I'm bound to find a pony. <laughs> Here's the point. You can choose your internal reaction to any external situation. Now, let me say that one more time. You can choose your internal reaction to any external situation in that space between the event 
And what you do about that event, you have a choice. And you can choose faith or you can choose fear. You can choose trust or you can choose worry. But friends, you can't choose both. Because faith and worry are opposite ends of the same spectrum. Worry, Jesus said, is faithlessness. Second thing Jesus said that worry is, is foolishness. Look at verse 27. Who of you, by worry, can add a single hour to his life? Has worry ever solved a problem? Has anxiety ever healed a hurt? Has worry ever brought to bear God's power and grace to a desperate need? Prayer has. Faith has. Godly planning has. But worry? Never. Worry will never alter life's events. Never alter life's events for good. You've seen it. If you, if, you, if you play golf and you've been out on the golf course, you've done it. If not, you may have seen other golfers, even pros, do it. You know, they get up there, they line up the putt, and they make it. And just as soon as that ball begins to veer off a little bit, they're doing this. <laughs> have you ever seen that work? I have never seen that work. But you know why we do that? I mean, some guy out there in golf knickers looking all foolish, he looks you know why we do that? Because even when we are powerless, we like to act like we are in control. And that's what worry is, trying to be in control when we are powerless to change certain things. We can make a major step forward toward a life of joy and assurance once we realize there's just all kinds of things that come our way that we can't control. Worry won't control it. The amount of faith you have won't control it. There are just some things that are out of your hands and my hands. No matter what we do, we're not going to change the direction. Fortunately, those things are in God's hands, and prayer can make a difference. But remember, prayer and worry are opposites. We bring our rightful and healthy concerns before the Lord in prayer, but we don't bring our hands and worry about it when we're praying about it. So here's the point. Worry is the illusion that I still have the power to make it right. Prayer is the honesty that says, God, I can't make it right. You take control. So worry cannot add a single hour to your life. That's what Jesus says. One last word Jesus gives us in his description of worry is this. Worry fosters failure. Worry about the future will cause you to fail in the present. Look at verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Worry about tomorrow, and you won't have the energy, the strength, and what you need to handle what's coming your way today. That's what Jesus says. Focus your attention on what may or may not happen, and you will lose sight of what is happening. Decide to worry about what might happen tomorrow, and you will miss out on what you can do about the things that are happening today. You know where we get the word anxiety is from a Latin word that means to choke. Our Anglo-Saxon version of that word is the word worry, and it means to strangle. And that's because anxiety chokes the life out of us and worry begins to strangle our strength and our power. Fear about the future will paralyze your present. Alistair McLean, who was a preacher in the, in the cloth of, of, of some of the other great ones, tells the story of a man, a doctor, who was bedridden in London. He was paralyzed physically, but his spirit was so full of overcoming his his disability and his adversity. He was so cheerful that visitors left, not with pity, but full of admiration and inspiration. And children adored him. He was just, he was so cheerful. When one of his boys left out on his own, McLean says that the doctor said this to him, and I quote to you, the main thing is to hold up your end, son. Do it like a gentleman, and please remember, your biggest problems 
are the ones you'll never have to face. Your biggest problems are the ones you'll never have to face. Think back on your life. I think back on my life and some of the things that I've worried the most about never happened. There's even a percentage that says that, you know, that problems that you worry about, that percentage, it, it never comes about. I don't remember what that percentage is. I'm not here to quote to you that kind of statistic except just for you to remember those times when you've been so worried, so absolutely almost sick, worried about something, and then it just never happened. This doctor told his son, the biggest problems you'll ever have to face are the ones that you'll ever have to face. So here's the point. If you use today's strength for today's problems, you can get somewhere to help work it out. If you use today's strength for tomorrow's problems, you will fail at what you've got to do today to take care of today's needs. Worry about the future fosters failure in the present. Now that's needless worry. That's not healthy concern, and that certainly is not godly planning. That's just needless, hand-wringing, chronic worry. So Jesus says worry is faithlessness, it's foolishness, and it fosters failures. And Jesus says, don't do it. Just don't do it. But how do we stop worrying? How do we just don't do it? Think about this. God would never command us not to do something if there wasn't a way for us not to do it. Right? When Jesus says, do not fear, when Jesus says, do not worry, when Jesus says, do not be anxious, we have the ability to be obedient to those commands. Now the problem is, we sometimes think that it's all about our ability. It's totally about my ability and my strength to not worry and not fear and not be anxious. I will just tell myself to quit. I can do it. I will will it so. Jesus knows something about you and Jesus knows something about me that sometimes you won't admit about you and that I won't admit about me and that is I can't do that on my own. I need other people. I need trust in the God who can take what little bit I can offer and give and do and magnify it and build on that foundation. I cannot not worry, not be anxious, and not fear on my own. But it's a command in the Bible. Do not. Do not fear. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. I truly believe that God and, 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 and God and Jesus would not command us not to do that if there wasn't a way for us not to do that. So what's the prescription that Jesus gives us when we need to overcome anxiety and worry? Three things real quick. Bam, bam, bam. So listen closely. Number one, remember who God is. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they. Who is God? God is a heavenly Father that sees you as valuable. God is a God who loves you. He is a love that will not let you go. But Jesus says God is more than just that. He's also a capable provider. Look at the birds. They don't work and God feeds them. How much more can He feed you who do work? God is a faithful provider. God is a wise sustainer. Verse 32. The pagans run after all these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. God knows your needs. He knows your needs. He knows my needs better than you or I. He knows what you do need. He knows what you don't need, and He knows how to get it to you. So how can you overcome worry? Remember who God is. He's our loving Father. He is a capable provider, and He's a wise sustainer. Step number two, commit yourself to His kingdom. Look at verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What things? All these things. What are these things? Clothing, food, the things you need, the provisions that you need to get through this day and, and the days after. The manna for today and then the manna anew for tomorrow. If you want to be free from worry, Jesus says, busy yourself with the business of God. Start doing things to love God and love others. You know, the secret of joy is not having little to do. The secret to joy is having great things to do. 
The secret of assurance is not having to always sacrifice or struggle, but having something worth struggling and sacrificing for. We think, those of us who are immature like I am sometimes, that I will know peace and joy when I have less to do and fewer pressures. I am guilty of that every single week. At the end of the week, I look back on it and think, man, if I just had more time. If I just had more peace. If I just had less pressure. If I just had more money. No. The secret of joy is not having a little to do. The secret of assurance is not having to always sacrifice and struggle. It's going for the bigger, the bigger picture. It's going for the kingdom. Because you are a child of God, because you are a spiritual being, Jesus called it God's kingdom and said, if you will seek it first, I'll take care of all the rest of that stuff. So step number one, remember who God is. Step number two, commit yourself to his kingdom. And last thing, do what you can do today. No matter how little it is, no matter how insignificant it may appear, do what you can do. It's, it's too easy sometimes to sit back and say, there's so much that needs to be done, I can't do anything, it won't make a difference. Not only can I make, not make a difference in my own life, I can't make a difference in anybody else's life, I certainly can't make a dent in what's happening in our country and in the world, so I just won't do anything, I will just sit here and worry about it. Jesus said, don't do that. Do what you can today. However little it is, and God will take that and magnify it and exponentially grow it and then build on that foundation so that great things can happen. Things that are totally out of our ability, certainly not out of God's ability. So there you have it. God's description of worry is that it's faithful, faithlessness, it's foolishness, and it fosters failure in the present too much of it in, into the future. Jesus' prescription for overcoming word. Commit yourself to his kingdom. Remember who God is. Capable provider, a wise sustainer. And then do today what little bit you can do. Just do that much. And bathe it in prayer. And God will take it. And use it. And we will give God praise. So, God's got this. Get a good night's sleep tonight. God's up all night anyway. In the name of the Father and the Son and the